Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you also for the kind invitation for this wonderful conference. And I'm very honored to be the first one to be technically able to speak now. And uh, I will take the fast train because I'm talking about the, um, the archaeology in, within the metro project, uh, the new metro in Amsterdam, the north-south line, which has been constructed between 2003 and 2018 for 15 years, crossing from the north through the medieval town, underneath the harbor, through the medieval town, and through the canal zone, the UNESCO area of Amsterdam. You see here the ground plan of Amsterdam, the historical city. Um, the, ton, the, the project was an innovative project in a technological sense because uh, a tunnel has to be drilled at 30 meters of depth, and that's, in terms of heritage, a meager, uh, a meager period, because we're talking about the last ice age at 30 meters of depth. But the engineers, they, they also had a trick to follow the open infrastructure in the historical center. Here you see the medieval city of Amsterdam, um, and in the middle you see the river Amstel, and the tunnel was drilled underneath the river at 30 meters of depth. But for us archaeologists, it was the building sites at these three sites which gave access to the riverbed of the River Amstel because part of that river has been filled in. And you can imagine, if you see this historical picture, what is the value of a river in the historical center or in the center of a historical city because it was the main artery, it was the transport um, avenue, but it was also open water. And people all over the world, they have the same instinctive behavior. When they, they get rid of garbage, they throw it in the water because it sinks away, it washes away, you get rid of it. So our prediction was that these building sites would have a really high archeological potential. And apart from garbage, thrown away intentionally. The heritage was also consist of lost objects because when you look over the bridge and your glasses fall in the water, they're gone and you never find them back until archeologists come. So I will talk about one project because we only have 20 minutes. Um, and that's the project on the, on the section of the River Amster called Rokin. And it's in the center of the city and be for 1937, it was still open water. And in 2005 till 2008, it was turned into a building site. It was filled in in 1937 and then excavated in, in these years to make a station. Um, my presentation will be on the public value of archaeological heritage in the context of this public project. And I will discuss a number of products we made for the public use, analog, old-fashioned products like books, uh, but also websites and other presentations. And in, in the research, um, for research purposes, we also made a number of digital uh, products like this 3D GIS. This, is the, this blue box is in fact the building site, 200 meters long, 40 meters wide, and 30 meters deep. And it was excavated in a really old-fashioned way, but also innovative. You see a, 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 a closed box with a ceiling that's the underside of the street because the cars and the tramway and the pedestrians, they, 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 they did what they wanted to do. And underneath, machines were digging uh, every time five meters of soil, and they did it five times. Each, each operation was three months and in, in two years' time, we arrived at 30 meters of depth. But what the excavator was digging away was for the contractor just sand and silt uh, and clay. But for us, it was the content of a river. This is a sketch we made on the backside of a beer moth, you know, the most uh, genius things you do, very simple. And with this, we convinced the directors of the North South Line that we had to be integrated in their project. And what you see is a cross section of the building site. You see the deep walls, uh, and you see uh, an hypothesis, because we didn't have any uh, concrete information about what would be there uh, underneath the two or three meters of sand on top. 
uh, of what was remaining of that old riverbed. And if there would be a riverbed, we expected it would be full with heritage, with archaeological remains. So our archaeology was integrated in the building process, in the civil engineering process, and archaeologists did what they wanted to do, that's documenting the context. So for the first time we could uh, registrate the, the real river. And here you see like in a sketchbook of a child how the top layer of the river was consisting of uh, the sand on top, that's the sand of 1937, and the black layer, that's the 19th century, and the brownish layer is the 18th century, and then underneath is the 17th century. We, at the, at the beginning, there was a lot of criticism, because why to excavate a river? Because it's all chaos, which, with current and storms and water, is mixing everything. But here you see there is systematics. I've been an underwater archaeologist for 30 years, and I know that despite the fact that water is really dynamic, there is also uh, order. This is the second layer of excavation from 7 meters to 12 meters. You see a completely different river. Instead of a U-shaped, it's a very wide river. This is medieval. Uh, you see different layers and different riverbeds. There are two, for example, coming from underneath. It's a prehistoric river going back to 3,000 3, years before, uh, before Christ. So it's a very complex geological situation. Hey, you see, technology works. And he, this is just uh, a composition of digital images representing a kind of time elevator going down from 6 meters to 11 and a half meters and you see the underside of the river. You see a very complex geological um, situation. I won't go into that because we're talking here about today about uh, cultural heritage. But I just want to show you that Within this digital environment, we could make a really detailed reconstruction of the physical appearance of this river, which was the context of all the material remains. Because that sand and clay was filled with objects. And we deployed all kinds of means to get as much objects as possible within the limited time frame of the infrastructural work. Because, of course, the metro had to be finished within time and without any more costs. Um, and here you see one of our devices, it's a big sieving machine with uh, double decks and with uh, conveyor belts and people were working there in shifts from morning till night to get all the objects out which were pumped from underneath, uh, underneath the building site. And it looks really innovative, but I tell you it's just a Dutch potato sieving machine we changed into a archaeological device. So you have to be innovative in a very simple way. And uh, despite the crude appearance, uh, it was able to collect really small material like this thimble and coins and all kinds of little things also. And that resulted in this massive amount of finds. It's just a harvest of two weeks work. Uh, thousands of these bags full of garbage which Amsterdam people has thrown into the river and then archaeologists centuries later come and paid by tax money to get all the garbage out again and turn it into stories. And that's all what heritage is all about. Turn old stuff, garbage, lost objects into stories about the city and its people. And because some of the sites, the Rokin was closed, but the Damrak, the other side, was still open water in 2005 when we started. So the array of archaeological remains was dating from 2005, and I tell you the oldest ones were dating from 120,000 before Christ. Not objects, little shells from the tropical sea which was situated where Amsterdam is now. And this is one of the secrets of the project that by combining recent material and old material, people start to understand in a really um, playful way how your material uh, environment is changing all the time. Because if you show a kid an I, a, a mobile phone from 1980, that, that kid doesn't understand that you can telephone with it because you have to push buttons and you don't swipe. So things change very quickly. Altogether, 
we got 700,000 fines and we turned it into a database of 145,000 records. Uh, and, but what it was telling, um, you see here in a really simple way, the, the red rectangle is the building site and it's embedded in a really dense urban structure of houses, workshops, churches, institutions, and all the activities of the people in, in these buildings, they left the traces in the river. In fact, the working title of our project is that the River Amstel is a mirror of the city, reflecting materially the, mater the, the history of the city. And we turned, and that is one of the digital projects, we turned the river into a uh, knowledge machine. This is a 3D GIS of the content of the river, and we can ask that database all kinds of questions about the provenance of objects, uh, we can make selections um, from certain areas or certain depths. So archaeological objects, they don't talk by themselves. You see here also in the museum, when you see an object, there is always an explanation. And in order to get an explanation, we have to process, we have to process all these materials. That's the golden rule in archaeology. One hour excavation is 10 hours of post-processing. Because the, the functional array, the, the diversity was enormous. You can imagine the river accepts everything. Normally in excavation, the material remains uh, are defined by the activities of that specific site. But the river receives everything. And it's a cross-section of material culture through all the ages of the existence of Amsterdam. That's why we developed a classification system which was reflecting not the archaeological reality but the reality of the city uh, and we, we ordered and classified all the, all the objects from the river in this classification representing the ten basic functions of a city. Well, I won't go into detail because um, uh, there is not much time for that, we can discuss that later, but it, this approach, this functional approach, where not the objects are central, but the city is the pivot, um, was resulting in a, in a number of really um, new um, visions. And we used this, um, this system for the different public um, products we made. The first one was a book, uh, a photo catalog, 30,000 pictures, um, without text because we wanted to have a low-key, accessible uh, presentation of what the river was presenting. And we combined new design by Willem van Zoetendaal and really high-quality photography into a, uh, a new experience of how you can look at the city, uh, also by combining all kinds of materials through their functional identity. This is a page uh, on craft, and it's, it's about fire making. And of course you understand immediately when you see the right hand side because you still recognize uh, a, a, a lighter. But now you know that the objects on the left hand side are the same. It's a fire iron which was used to make fire in the 15th century. So the iron object is the same as the project, plastic object. And normally you don't get these combinations because materials are... That's fast. Um, yeah. Anyway, the book will be here and you can have a different look. Apart from functional um, classification, objects tell stories. I will tell you, I wanted to tell you three stories, I will tell you two stories because this time is lacking. Here is one of the finds we got out of the river and then you ask yourself why would an archaeologist excavate this and do processing on it because it's very obvious what it is. It's, it's the wheel of a fort because it's written on it and the fort fabric probably has a lot of archival material explaining the technology of this wheel. But the thing is it's part of the urban history. So this object is part of events. And for example, urban archaeologists, they work not only with material remains but also with pictures and uh, paintings and uh, written sources and this is a photograph uh, of the site of the, the exact spot where this wheel was found in 2005 and this is a picture of 1929 
And then you can, ask, you can say again, you know, well, do all this excavation because you already can have, have this picture from the archive and why would you excavate it? Well, I'm a generalist. I don't know nothing about cars. I thought we had here a connection. And then somebody, who, a technologist who is really knows everything about cars, he said, well, a good try, but this is not a Ford, this is a Chevrolet. So we, here we have a wheel and a historical event, but still we have a question. It's not the same event. And that's the fun part of archaeology. You can find things and it raises more questions. I will leave these out. I just wanted to give you one example of what you can do with digital means and the meaning of, of objects in 3D dimensions. This is a very classic archaeological find, bones. And they are the remains of food. They all have been butchered. And they have a really clear concentration in front of these alleys. And if you would go into these alleys in 1650, this is one of these alleys, you would go to the end of the street and you would arrive here, the meat hall of Amsterdam in the 17th and 18th century. So these archaeological distributions from 2005, 2008 reflect exactly the behavior of the, of the, the, the butchers who dropped their garbage every day in the river at the end of the alley. And with the archaeological remains, we can have information about the species, the age, uh, the provenance, and uh, much more detailed information about meat consumption and production in Amsterdam. To finish, we were part of a public project and we had the possibility to think about the presentation of some of the remains in, in one of the stations, in the station Rokin. And we were part of the uh, uh, um, we, di we dis discussed with the architects and they came up with a solution that in between the elevators, you see the, uh, the elevators, escalators are in the pack there in the, in, the, in the brown paper and in the middle you see empty space and we designed a showcase there uh, to have, that's the only space left in the station because all the, sp all the walls are for security and publicity and we don't have that amount of money. But we had this space and we turned it into two showcases of 12 and 40 meters long and three and a half meters wide, really massive, with altogether 10,000 finds without labels. We worked together with two artists, Gregory Shikil and Daniel Devar, they're English, French, and, and they were part of the art plan of the uh, of the station. Each station had, had an art plan. Uh, so they made the decorations of the platforms in, in, in stone mosaic and they used as an inspiration uh, daily life objects because archaeology is about daily life objects. Uh, and, but they transformed it into the modern reality. And we worked together with them to make this display with as basic function no design because each each uh, uh, attempt of design will, has a, sometimes a very artificial, um, uh, artificial result. So on the left-hand side top you see the empty space and we started to arrange according to the same classification system I showed you before, which was reflecting the city, we made all these themes, filled them with the material remains and we made, we attached them to panels. We made the same archaeologists who did the excavation and the processing, I'm very proud that they also made with their hands the panels which were part of the display. Uh, altogether we made a hundred panels and here you see them uh, together uh, in one of the showcases together uh, in the station. But the problem is with this public museum is that the visitors are not prepared, so you're standing there and then you suddenly see all these objects and you stand on an escalator which doesn't stop. Normally at the showcase when you want to see something you can stop and have a look. And that's why and, and it's this abundance of material which you want to get acquainted to. Uh, so this is what you can experience. Uh, I won't try to get on the internet but you can later on, not here, you can take your phone and punch in below the surface dot Amsterdam. Uh, it's a website and when you click on the lines on the right hand side you get the English version 
and you can get three things here. You can a database from uh, below the surface, so it starts at 2005 and it goes all the way down till 120,000 before Christ. You can jump through history and you can also look uh, thematically, so you can look at use, uh, you can jump through time, uh, and then of each object, and this website contains 20,000 pictures, uh, you, can, you can touch each object and you get all the archaeological information. At the same time, you have access to the content of the showcases. You can zoom in and touch each object and you can get the information from the database. And finally, because archaeology should be fun, uh, there is a third function where people can use those 20,000 pictures for themselves and make their own showcases. And uh, we are now having, I think, fi almost 5,000 in incredible uh, individual uh, creations of, from people all over the world using the heritage from the River Amstel for their own fantasy. Thank you very much.